my lovelies. Welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Today is a bizarre day. If you're watching this in the future, it's going to mean absolutely nothing to you. But tomorrow, I start my crime tour. So when you're watching this, I'll be like two weeks into it, around theatres in the UK. I'm terrified. I've just got to share it with you because I love my crime community. And I am panic stricken. So before I go into today's YouTube, if I seem a little bit more edgy, that's why. Because tomorrow night, I'm going to be stood on a stage in Newcastle, freaking out. Hmm, be zen, Emma. Anyway, thought I'd say it just in case I seem a little bit more animated than normal. I'm doing the Serial Killer Next Door tour. If you're watching it in the UK, and it's only a few weeks from when I've released it, and you want to see me, I'll put a link below so that you can kind of see what I'm doing. And if you want to come and see me, let me know. I know some of you are doing, I can't wait to meet you. I'm going to be doing a meet and greet afterwards where I basically hug people because I've not been out of my lounge for like 18 months. Today's case is one I'm going to be covering because it's really local to me and also because my sister taught at the victim's school. So there's a personal element. Before I start, I just want to say again, a big thank you to all of you supporting me on Patreon. Mind-blowing, can't believe you do, but kind of means like I get to do more content and I also get to create better content. So I'm not going to lie, you're amazing. And so is every single one of you who comes relentlessly and religiously to my lives where we all chat and also to just view my footage again and again and again. I see the same people commenting, the same engagement. I absolutely love it. I feel like we're a thriving community and at a time where life has been pretty isolating and certainly challenging on all fronts, this community has saved me in so many ways and I just want to acknowledge that just in case I die on stage tomorrow night. And this is like the last YouTube video that you ever see of me. Just know you are appreciated, as Tupac would have said. Right, today's case is going to be that of Sophie Lancaster. As I said, Sophie grew up very locally to me, so I know the area very well. And my sister actually taught at her school and knew Sophie. I've also covered this on terrestrial television. But as you guys know, I'm kind of doing a deep dive of my cases that I've covered on TV because I've never, ever been able to tell the stories thoroughly or I feel in testament enough to the victims. Also, I want to let you know, before I start talking about this, that I recently covered Alison Botha case. And as you know, you guys made so many comments on that case and you sent out so much love and joy to Alison and you wanted her to know one impact that you'd had on her life. And I want you to know that Alison got in touch with me to say thank you to you because the comments were incredible and the fact that she picked up that we covered the case and that we covered it in a loving way. Wow, guys, that is amazing. So Alison just wanted to say thanks. On top of that, for those of you who don't know, I also covered Jacob Eines, and you'll remember he was the young man who was sent to prison and eventually released, and we all had some really positive things to say about him. And again, the family's been in touch to say that they're really glad that we understood the case from a different angle to the sensationalised kind of ways that has been covered before and wanted us all to know that he's happy. So I feel like I want to share that with you because sometimes when we're just sat doing these YouTube videos or chatting to each other on lives, we don't necessarily realise the impact that we're having when we're telling these stories fairly and respectfully. And I really want to do that on this channel. I want to talk about cases respectfully. I know I've got gallows humour. I know I say nasty things about killers and all of those things. I get that. But I also think that we're doing justice to the victims and also, at times, to perpetrators of crime that weren't treated fairly. That said, that rambling monologue done, let's talk about today's case. So I'm going to take you back to 2007. In 2007, I'm going to be really honest, there was a lot of youth gang-related violence in the UK. So in the August of that year, 11-year-old Rhys Jones, you'll all remember, that little 11-year-old boy was murdered in Liverpool. He was shot by a 16-year-old gang member. Totally innocent boy. Also father of three, Gary Newlove, 
He was beaten to death by a group of teenagers outside his home in Warrington. That was the same month that Reese was killed. The following year, 17 teenagers, 17 teens were stabbed to death in London, alone. That included Ben Kinsella, You'll remember that's the half-brother of EastEnders actress Brooke Kinsella, who's become a massive advocate around knife crime. In fact, the then Conservative leader, David Cameron, remember him? He was one of the people responsible for ruining the country. I could have lived in Europe. Thanks, David. Sorry, but, you know, it was really convenient when you could get just, like, a visa to go and live anywhere in Europe, and now we can't. It's really hard, because I've looked. But he referred to the UK as broken Britain, and he had this real desire to explore youth crime and also brought to light the fact that we did genuinely, when you look at the crime stats, have a growing problem with violence, particularly in young people. And gang mentality and youth violence felt pretty much around 2007, 8, 9, 10 to almost become the norm. And I think that we've seen increases in gang violence more and more year on year. Now, for us, where I live, of course, Greater Manchester, we have gang issues. We have had Doddington, we've got the equivalent of what they consider the Bloods and the Crips. There are lots of different kind of factions. But when it comes to where I live, really, there isn't that much gang experience. We have a few small tribes, shall I say, who go around causing what I would say is criminal damage and often getting into fights with marauding gangs that they kind of see as their alters. But they're not necessarily that problematic. We have had one shooting here in the past 12 months. But Baycup, which is a little town near me, even though it had youth violence, is certainly not known for gang violence at all. And yet it was going to become the centre of devastating repercussions. Bakeup is a really old northern town, it's a mill town. Small, has its issues. I would say lower socio-economic bracket, but also very tight community, so really safe in many ways to bring your children up. But it has fringes of criminal behaviour and problems. And that's essentially where our story begins and ends. So Sophie Lancaster was born on the 26th of November, 1986. She actually grew up in Haslingdon. Now Haslingdon is just down the road from Bakeup. Her mum was Sylvia, her father was John, and she also had her brother Adam. My best friend grew up in Haslingdon, so I spent a lot of my childhood hanging out under bridges there and doing all the things that teenagers do. Now, Sophie attended Bakeup and Rotten Store Grammar School, but she also, before that, attended Haslingdon High School, which is where my sister teaches and taught English. And Sophie was an absolutely gifted English student. She had some attitude as well, positively, by the way, not a negative attitude, from anecdotal evidence about her. She was quite spunky. She was an individual who stood her ground and she was eloquent and articulate, but she was also quiet. At the time that she was killed, she was actually planning to start an English degree after having a gap year. So she was talented. And I always explore when we're looking at these victims of crime, the potential. Because what we know about Sophie was that she was a unique individual. You'll see that from her pictures. She had deep ethics. You'll see that from her behaviour that I talk about. But also, she was deeply intelligent. She was somebody who was gonna make a really positive contribution to this world. And as I always say, I'm not trying to diminish other deaths. A child killed in a gang crime because they're in a gang, they still have the same ramifications and impact on families. Their life has as much meaning. I'm just talking about, it's very difficult when you hear about stories like Sophie's, where you know that there was something really powerful and positive that was gonna impact the world because of her being. When her mum was interviewed, and I've been very lucky to watch Sophie Lancaster's mother in action, I've attended some of her workshops where she's talking about prejudice. And she's an incredible human with an incredible legacy for her daughter. And I've had the fortune to hear her describe her daughter as strong-willed, independent, 
she's funny, she's feisty, she's one of those young women who had real gumption and you knew when she entered a room. One, because of the way that she looked, secondly because of her incredibly beautiful smile and also because even though she wasn't overconfident, she stood her ground. I like young people who have those kind of markers. It makes them stand out, doesn't it? One of the things I really relate to with this young woman is that at the age of six, she announced that she was going to be vegetarian. And from six years of age, from that decision until her death, she was a vegetarian. So similar to me, when I was nine, I walked past a field that usually had sheep in, and I remember saying to my mum, where have the sheep gone? And she was like, oh, probably about the time to tell you that your dad eats them. And I was like, what? And at that point, I realised that what I was served had once been alive. And that was the end of meat eating for me. And that's why I brought my entire family up to be vegan and vegetarian. It's because of that moment. So I really empathise with Sophie. And it says something, again, not judging you meat eaters. Before you all get in touch and you're like, Emma, I like eating meat. It's fine. You do you. And I don't judge you at all. What I'm saying is, I think it says something about somebody's belief in non-discriminatory practice in life. So that every life has value. And Sophie Lancaster felt that. She was a massive reader. She was so into books. In fact, she was known for finishing a whole book in a day. She had a voracious connection and love with the English language. She loved stories of all types and that encouraged her vocabulary and meant that she was an individual who always had words. And that's another important thing. This is a girl who, if she needed to express herself, explain herself, deal with conflict, she had the power of words. Most of us will know individuals like that. They don't need to shout, they don't need to scream, they don't need to argue and swear in a way that is negative. They can express themselves because they have this incredible vocabulary and that was her. And this is why the end that she meets is so wrong. Because she was somebody with the power to diffuse conflict in normal situations. Now, when her mother talks about Sophie, she says that as she grew into her young teens, she kind of started to change her appearance. And I'm going to put some pictures up because she had a real own style. And you guys know I used to be a goth. Still, I'm recovering. I keep my eyeliner like this because every 15 years it comes back in style. So may as well just stick with it, right? But when I was Sophie's age at her death, I had black eyeliner, you know, all the way to the sides here. That was the way that I expressed myself. And Sophie was known for wearing a full length black leather coat. She dyed her hair black. It was just the way she was, as far as her mother was concerned. She considered that she'd always been a little bit different. And even though she also considered, particularly in the area, because if you live in Haslingdon, that makes you really stand out. And it clearly would have made her look a little bit of an outsider. Her mum said that she always felt that she really did look beautiful, and she did. Sophie Lancaster was really beautiful. She also had about 20 piercings. Again, I relate to that so much. My ears were done eight times. I won't tell you about the other places that I had pierced, but let's just say they were pierced. And she used to wear dreadlocks, and a lot of the time they'd be dyed red. She was just instantly recognisable in the town. And so was her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was very, very similar. So 20-year-old Sophie and her boyfriend, 21-year-old Robert Maltby, they'd been together for three years. Again, I'm putting my own judgments on this, but that's what I'm here to do. I think to be in a relationship for three years at that age, it shows emotional maturity, doesn't it? I mean, a lot of us can't manage months, but these two had connected and been deeply in love for a long period of time. And Robert was actually doing art. He was an art student from Manchester. Similarly to Sophie, he stood out in the way that he looked. He got a pierced lip, he backcombed his hair, and often he'd wear makeup. Again, I just think that's so cool. I look back at my youth, and those kind of boys really sparked something in me. Individuals who are subculture-led, who don't go with the crowd, 
who are more concerned about cultivating something unique and genuine to them. And yet, of course, subcultures are all about fitting into certain demographics and paradigms. But you take a risk, don't you, when you stand out like that? Because not everyone's comfortable with individuals. And often, when people look a certain way, people believe that they've got a confidence because they're willing to stand out, but that's rarely true. Very often people who wear makeup and have their hair in crazy styles, it isn't actually about confidence at all. It's almost like wanting to make it so that if a person meets you and accepts you, they've got past that initial feeling that they're not going to reject you. So it's almost like a defense mechanism. The more that you get accepted as you are when you stand out in a way that isn't typical and somebody's nice to you, you're like, oh, this person's kind of passed the most important test. They're accepting. So the idea that people who dress up in different kind of styles and really stand out are overconfident is just a complete myth. It's usually quite the contrary. They had met when he was working for the summer at a local kitchen and bedroom manufacturing firm and they'd been introduced by friends. Best way to meet. Just saying, if any of you are single out there, evidence says, best way to meet is to get your mates to find somebody because they know the kind of person that you like. So whilst dating apps work to a degree, it's miles better if you can be like, check out your Facebook mates or your Insta mates. Because when you're introduced that way, often you're introduced on a level where they know that you're gonna kind of get on. Just saying this isn't a dating channel, but if you're gonna take my advice, you might meet the love of your life. Anyway, they really clicked. They had that deep, intimate level. And they'd actually been living together in a flat that they'd rented in Bake Up for six months. So they'd got really, really serious. Both of them, from the pictures that you'll see, massively into the alternative goth scene, dress accordingly, live accordingly. But anybody who knew this couple, and it was as a couple they described, they were known as sensitive, intelligent, caring individuals, about as far away from trouble causes as possible. You know, both of them had experienced prejudice. The appearance that was obviously very different to people in their local area had caused bullying, and they were used to being shouted at in the street. They were used to local youths taking the piss out of them and it was something that they accepted was part of their subculture experience. It's not right. No one has a right to do that. It's offensive that anybody believes that they have a right to question anybody else's choices. It's a bizarre thing in my mind. And I often think about the individuals who are choosing to do that and what it says about them. And when I look at youths in particular and youths who tend to dress in a certain way in a uniform, there's a lot of uniform expression in youth culture today. My own children are very much part of that, you know, they don't step too much out of the boundaries of convention. It's Nike trousers, Nike hoodie, because as long as you're not being noticed, if you're not being stood out, you don't cause yourself any issues, right? But that also says again about an insecurity and a lack of confidence as opposed to an arrogance or an overconfidence. So when these people are shouting horrible names, often what they're trying to do is fit in. They're just choosing to fit in, in the wrong place. And I think that that speaks volumes about the insecurity in our youth and also a growing lack of connection with community and often with family, that they have those fractures within themselves. So Sophie and her boyfriend had had to put up with quite a lot of this negativity. So on the 11th of August 2007, they'd spent the evening at a friend's house, that was Jonathan Smethurst, and they left around 11.40pm and they were going to walk two miles to their home. Now, where they lived again, even though it's got built up areas, it's also quite a lot of rural landscape and understandably two miles for two fit young people is something I completely connect with. Why spend the money on public transport? At the end of the day, it's a nice walk. On the way home, they pass a petrol station and it's at this petrol station there's a group of local teenagers and they're all gathered together they go into the actual garage buy some cigarettes and they even get into a conversation with them they even give them cigarettes i don't want you to think about that sophie and her boyfriend had a good night with a friend walking home come across a group of younger youths buy cigarettes, expensive, let's be honest, even when this happened, when this crime occurred. 
and they give them cigarettes. They're warm, they're inviting, they're kind. So now they've got into this conversation with these youths. The whole group, including Sophie and Robert, basically go to Stubbly Park, which is in Bakeup. And Robert said, even though the conversation was okay, he started to feel a little bit nervous because even though he was with this group of young people, he knew that whilst the park was a regular hangout for local teenagers, it wasn't necessarily the kind of place that he would hang out because it was pretty infamous for things like underage drinking, criminal behaviour, vandalism, you know, the kind of things that happen at parks. Now, two of the teenagers that Sophie and her boyfriend got talking to were 15-year-old Ryan Herbert and Brendan Harris. These boys had a lot of history. Their previous convictions for violence after assaulting a 16-year-old boy in 2007. They did get away with community sentences, and that is normal. You know, we don't want to criminalise young people in secure units and in young offenders because it tends to set a pattern. And community sentences are meant to impart a restorative narrative to their experience. So around 1.10 a.m., we have Sophie and Robert passing through the skateboard area of the park. At this point, five of the young people, this is including Herbert and Harris, who I've just mentioned, suddenly, and I mean from nowhere, attack Robert. There's no warning, no provocation, no argument, no escalation. This is out of nowhere. Also remember, when you're in a situation where there hasn't been an escalation, when you are in an argument, when there isn't conflict, you're not prepared. Because the normal situation psychologically, when we are dealing with a fight is, we have adrenaline and cortisol going through our system, and even when there might be three of them, but the point is, we are prepared. And that means that to some degree, we can have a defensiveness, whether that's running, which is something I'd advise, or whether that's standing and fighting. But if it comes from nowhere, you are hugely unprepared. Your body isn't ready for it. You are absolutely an innocent victim and you are a defenseless victim. The other three attackers were brothers, Joseph and Danny Hume, they were 16 and 15, and also Daniel Mallet, 17. So these are young teens. Turns out these guys were thought to be members of a gang called the Bake Up Terror Group. Honestly, when I say that, there's almost a bit of comedy that I want to throw in, because if you knew Bake Up, you'd be like, Bake Up Terror Group? I mean... It's not even a good name, let alone the area itself doesn't really lend itself to what you'd imagine gangland activities. But again, this is the thing about youth culture, isn't it? There's so much online now, there's so much on YouTube, and there's so many people who express beefs with each other that we're getting more and more gangs growing because young people are seeing it as an opportunity to connect and fit in. Now, all of these boys who attacked Sophie's boyfriend had been drinking. They drank at least four pints of strong cider. They'd also been drinking schnapps, several shots of them, so they were inebriated. Now, according to witnesses, someone actually shouted, let's bang him. Now, I know that in some countries, let's bang him might sound sexual, but in the north of England, it means I'm going to have a fight with you. And at this point, Harris initiated an attack with a flying kick to Robert's head, so a really, really serious assault. Robert's kicked punched to the ground and he's actually knocked unconscious. So we are talking serious injuries. To be knocked unconscious is a very serious head injury. Now, once he's on the floor, you'd think that they'd leave him, right? They've done their work, they've banged him out, but no. Instead, they start viciously kicking him in the head and his body. They also repeatedly stamp on his head. Now you all know how dangerous that is. Even worse, the witnesses who saw this happening said that they were goading each other on. They were encouraging each other to go further. And I know that some of your thoughts right now will be, hang on a minute, witnesses, what were they doing? But when we look at 
shall we say, bystander interaction, intervention, Kitty Genovese killed even on a street where she was screaming for help. People just ignored her. We know that very often others wait for others to intervene. In fact, it can be more likely that you'll get help if one stranger is walking by than if a group are around. But witnesses are watching this play out. Now we know that Sophie has deep ethics. She's vegetarian. We appreciate that she cares deeply about life and she is in love with her boyfriend. She runs straight to his aid. She gets down on the floor. She cradles his head in her lap and she's screaming and begging for help. And she's begging for them to stop. Of course she is. She knows that this is seriously injuring her partner. Can you imagine the bravery it took for that girl to actually put herself at the center of that danger? The feeling that she had for her partner wasn't to run off, wasn't to leave, wasn't to try and get help from elsewhere. She didn't want to leave him. She wanted to protect him. But Robert's unconscious, so there's no fun there now because they can't get a reaction, right? So the group's ringleaders, Herbert and Harris, they decide it's time to turn their attention to Sophie. A young girl, a tiny, slight young girl. They start to kick her. Again, they punch her. They keep kicking her in the head. And again, she falls unconscious. Imagine that, how cowardly they have to be. Both of those individuals are unconscious. They're unable to defend themselves. Sophie was barely five feet tall. She weighed hardly anything. She was like a little bird. Totally outnumbered by drunken yobs. And I'm going to call them drunken yobs because they were. They had every opportunity to stop. And if it isn't bad enough knowing what they did to those kids, the witnesses that watched it said that those boys then started running up to Sophie and kicking her head like a football and then just jumping on her head. Can you imagine the damage? Kicking her head like a football and jumping on her head. A young man and a woman pretty much just after the attack encounter Herbert and he actually says to them, there's two moshers, nearly dead, up Baycup Park. Proud of it. And another witness described me and Herbert and Harris after the attack and said they were like really hyperactive, they were giddy, really boasting about what they'd done. Another of the youths, Joseph Hume, who'd taken part in the attack, he actually gave the witness a phone he'd taken off Robert. And he actually said to this witness, oh, we've left them in a right mess. So they've even taken items from Sophie and Robert. They're bragging about it. They also have acknowledged how damaged they are, how damaged Robert and Sophie are. Now, Jonathan Smethurst, that's the friend whose house Sophie and Robert had been at earlier, got a call from Robert's number about 1.30 a.m., nothing could be heard, okay? So obviously this call has gone through but you can't hear anything. But the next time it rings, about 40 minutes later, a young man says, have you got two friends in Baker Park? And obviously their friend thinking, what on earth is going on? Says, yeah. And the voice at the end of the phone says, well, there's two moshes here and they look like they're dead. Can you imagine his reaction? Suddenly a stranger's on the end of the phone. He knows whose phone it belongs to and he's being told that potentially his friends, two of his best friends, are dead in the park. And notice that they refer to them as moshers. So even the witness, who is obviously trying to get some help at this moment in time and is aware that something terrible has happened, they are dehumanising Sophie and Robert. They are not people, they are moshers. It's amazing how the psychology of crime does that. It's a way of disassociating the individuals from what's really happening. 
because what was really happening there was two innocent young people were being beaten almost to death. Now, Jonathan Smethurst immediately runs to the park and he finds it swarming with paramedics and police. It turns out that obviously one of the witnesses called the emergency services and they said, we need an ambulance at Baker Park. Again, they say, this mosher has just been banged because he's a mosher. Do you know what's really sad? That's absolutely true. Sophie and Robert, these kind people who earlier on had been sharing cigarettes and chatting. The reason that they got beaten up was because they didn't fit the ordinary paradigm within that area. They were seen as different. There was no other motivation. There wasn't a word wrong. There wasn't conflict. There wasn't history. There was just a simple difference in the way that they dressed. Another witness who was interviewed said that when they were looking at the injured pair, they just looked like dummies. They looked like there was nothing human anymore. And obviously, as paramedics arrive, the injuries that Robert and Sophie have received are catastrophic. Both lying side by side, covered head to toe in blood. And it was obvious from the get-go that they had been involved in a brutal and a sustained attack. And I remember when I did a television show and I was able to see some of the evidence. And one of the most difficult things I can remember working through in my mind was the fact that the couple's faces were so swollen they couldn't tell which one was Sophie and which one was Robert. Can you imagine how many injuries you need to sustain when you are unrecognisable to people who know you? That's how devastating these injuries were. Both of them are in a coma. Both of them suffering massive internal bleeding because of the injuries. When they x-ray Robert's skull, he's got bleeding on the brain. He's so ill, he's placed on a ventilator. He had 22 separate injuries, mainly bruising, obviously, abrasions, also this severe swelling to his face. And he actually remained in a coma for a week. And believe me, when you're in a coma for a week, you have sustained a serious brain injury. A serious brain injury. Sophie's transferred to my really local hospital. It's a hospital that I go to, which is Fairfield Hospital. She again had suffered 17 separate injuries to her head and to her body. Like Robert, sadly, most of the injuries were focused to her head. This bright, articulate, intelligent girl's brain was where most of the attacks had been taken out. She had been stamped on with such force that she had footprints left on each side of her face. And there were also star-shaped indents on her face from the end of the laces. That's how powerfully they were attacking her. Her ears were black and blue. Her head was horrifically swollen because she'd been stamped on so badly. Her injuries were so severe that they had to move her from Fairfield Hospital. They moved her to the neurology department at Hope Hospital in Salford. And on the 24th of August, her family, her loving, caring family, had to make the heartbreaking decision to have her life support switched off. She died in her mum's arms 13 days after the attack. 
she never regained consciousness. What was she guilty of? Walking home, chatting to a group of kids, protecting the man that she loved. And her mother had to hold her in her arms as they turned off that life support machine. Robert took a hell of a long time to get better from his horrific injuries. And when his mother went to court, she was amazing. And she actually made a victim statement, an impact statement, and explained how he still struggled. He suffered from poor short-term memory. He'd also become a recluse. He didn't really want to leave the house unless absolutely necessary. And actually, one of the other things that I've watched him interviewed and talk about is that he's become that man known for being beaten that way and from losing his girlfriend. And that it's almost like his identity has been taken because he's so associated with this horrific crime. The police obviously take this unbelievably seriously and they instantly start realising that this isn't just a few people. Around 15 individuals may have taken part in the attack. They spoke to over 100 people as part of the investigation. And it's on August the 11th, Herbert Harris and Daniel Mallet are arrested. Now Mallet lived with his mother, Tracy, and I'll be honest with you, he is the only one out of the boys, and this is gonna be highly judgmental of me, all right? It is, but my channel, my judgment. I would say he was the only one who came from a decent home. He was the only one who came from a home where you wouldn't necessarily expect these kind of behaviours. Obviously, we know psychopaths and sociopaths come from decent homes. But what I'm saying is when you look at the lives of the others, the historical family experience, you go, mm, I can kind of understand how they turned out that way. But I think Mallet was slightly an exception to the rule. But pack mentality can do a huge amount, can't it? It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. If the friends that you hang out with do certain things, often you can find yourself entertaining similar behaviours. Brothers Joseph and Danny Hume were arrested the following day. Now, they lived at a nearby traveller's site. So, again, they came from a community that is often known for, shall we say, being more physically aggressive as young men. And I say that from experience and love. I worked for a few years with traveling communities and specifically travelers who identify themselves as coming from the more gypsy community and being physically fit and being physically aggressive is part and parcel of the culture. But let me make it clear, when I worked on those sites, the boys there weren't going out, beating up and killing anybody. So when I tell you that they came from a traveller's site, I think there's a lot of prejudice that is associated with those particular minority groups. And I think that they are mythical most of the time, just to put that out there, because whenever I bring in a minority, I want to balance it. And like I said, some of the best people that I've ever worked with were travellers. Now, Herbert initially said that he was in the park at the time of the attack, but he says, I didn't have anything to do with it. Harris did admit to being in the park, and he also admitted that he was the first person to hit Robert. He also said to the police that there wasn't really any reason for him doing it. He was just really drunk. He's just showing off. Now, he said that's the only thing he did. He hadn't taken part in any other assaults. The Hume brothers, they just deny being involved in the attacks full stop. Mallet, he admits to striking Robert once with a clenched fist and said that Robert was still standing at that point. So they're all trying to make themselves seem minimal in the attack. Bear in mind, bear in mind, not the brightest and sharpest tools, are they? On the basis that we know they've been bragging to lots of people about the moshers that they've apparently made a real mess of. But remember, these young people aren't really thinking about reality. 
they're just thinking about, oh, maybe if I just lie, I'll get away with it. You know, maybe the police would be like, oh, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, so they didn't do anything, so it's fine. So again, very classic minimizing of action. Goes nowhere, of course, because all five of them are charged initially with GBH because they know that there was intent to harm both Sophie and Robert. However, Sophie dies. So that GBH charge immediately goes to murder and GBH with intent. That's a really serious charge, murder and GBH with intent. And that was at Burnley Youth Court, tried on the 6th of September, 2007. Now all three were given bail, which I find quite surprising, but none of them had had hugely violent histories. So I would imagine that to some degree, they felt that it was acceptable for them to be in the community. Whether you do or not is up to you to make that decision. I do think that to release three of them on bail when they had just essentially killed one person and near killed another one was probably taking a risk because one, they've got clear form and two, what have they got to lose when they're on murder charges? So it could have meant that they'd encourage themselves to go and do other crimes because they had nothing to lose. On the 14th of December, 2007, this drives me mad. All five of them said, not guilty. Now, you all know why that really annoys me. Because when you go not guilty, that means there's gonna be a full prosecution defense case. And that means that every single family member who has lost an individual that they have loved or has watched as an individual they love being horrifically attacked and beaten, they have to go through that trial. And during that investigation, it became apparent to the police that neither the suspects, the boys being tried, nor their parents seemed to have any reality about the seriousness of the attack and their actions. When I say the families didn't take it seriously at all, I can't get it across. I cannot express how unreal it was watching these parents dealing with this. It was as if it was just normal. There was absolutely no accountability and responsibility. And when you look at the history with the majority of the parents of these young people, complete lack of control. They used to let the kids out at very young age, drinking into the early hours. And the police were incredibly critical of the parents in this case. Again, I can't help it. I'm going to be really judgmental. What kind of mother, what kind of mother, when their child is with them, being questioned by the police for GBH and then a murder, what kind of mother is laughing and joking during questioning? Because could you imagine your child being guilty of that and you're just taking the piss during the interrogation and that's what happened. On the 10th of March 2008, this is when the trial begins. I cannot wrap my head around the conduct of the defendants and their families during the court hearings. It was dreadful. It was inexcusable. It was disgusting. I can't describe this swaggering behaviour of the defendants in court. And even in the interrogation, everybody who came into contact with them said they were just appalling. Now, I appreciate that some of you listening and also some of you who've worked with young people, you'll be aware that reputation means a lot to young people. And we often see in court scenarios, particularly gang related court scenarios, that the people who are being tried seem arrogant, cocky, and they're playing a role. They're actually terrified inside. And the reason they're doing it is one, they know they're gonna to go to prison. Secondly, they've got a reputation of a gang to uphold. And most importantly, when they go to prison, they don't wanna be seen as weak. I appreciate that. But their parents aren't there laughing. Their parents aren't there joking. 
the parents are behaving because they know how serious it is, not in this case. The families of these kids acted disgracefully. The defendants were actually seen winking in court to people that they knew, shouting out, love you mum, and their families were as disruptive as the defendants. Now the murder charge against the Hume brothers and Mallet actually were dropped because it was acknowledged that they hadn't taken part in the attack on Sophie. The murder charge against Herbert and Harris still stood. Now all five defendants at this point pleaded guilty to GBH with intent. I understand that this will be because they're trying to create the best plea deal possible. Remember, any court of law judges an individual more harshly who will not take responsibility. So it's always a gamble. When you go not guilty, it's a gamble. Obviously, if you're not guilty, definitely go not guilty. But for people who think that they can get away with it, they're actually looking at a longer sentence. So pleading guilty to GBH with intent is obviously saying, okay, we take some accountability for this. But just before the start of the trial, Herbert changed his plea and pleaded guilty to Sophie's murder. Harris, however, pleaded not guilty to murder. Again, interesting to see the advice there, isn't it? Is it a belief that one will be the fall guy? Or is it that one is thinking to themselves, my advice that I'm being given is you're going to get found guilty. You want to make sure that you acknowledge it so that you get a sentence that is less than you would if you're found guilty and you've denied it. So after a two week trial, Harris is found guilty of murder on the 27th of March, 2008. On the 28th of April, 2008, all five defendants are sentenced. Herbert and Harris are both sentenced to life imprisonment. Harris was given a minimum term of 18 years. Herbert was given a minimum term of 16 years and three months. Brothers Joseph and Danny Hume and Daniel Mallet, they were found guilty of GBH with intent in relation to the attack on Robert. The Hume brothers each were sentenced to five years and 10 months. Mallet was sentenced to four years and four months. I know that that sounds like a really short sentence, but actually where GBH with intent is concerned, that's actually quite a lengthy one. And particularly noting their age. Now the sentencing judge, you know how I love a sentencing judge. I feel like judges go on courses where they learn to be amazing orators, to just decimate the individuals who deserve decimating. And so that the families who listen so those judgment calls feel that some kind of justice has been done. I really do. I love a good judge summing up. It really resonates with me. But the sentencing judge makes reference to the seriousness, the aggravating factors in this case, including the fact that Sophie and Robert had literally been singled out on account of their appearance. And he equated it to a hate crime, and rightly so. Even though no weapons were used in the attack. The extent of the violence that was inflicted, he said, was cruel and sadistic behaviour. I think almost even worse, that they did it with their bare hands and feet. Also, we have to acknowledge that Harris and Herbert had a previous conviction for violence. And one of the big things that the judge said was, where is your empathy? Where is your remorse? And the little remorse that was shown, as far as he was concerned, was shallow and hollow. You won't be surprised to know that, as ever, every single one of the defendants appealed against their sentences. And fortunately, all but Herbert's were dismissed. Now, Herbert's was appealed and his minimum 16 years, three months sentence was reduced to 15 years and six months. And the reason for that was because apparently the trial judge was found to have given insufficient credit for the guilty plea. I told you. That's exactly why somebody who knows that the bank to rights and knows that they're gonna get caught and found guilty goes guilty. It's because the judge who's hearing the trial will go easier on them. So there wasn't enough of a distinction between the one who went not guilty and the one who went guilty. That's why 
they reduced it still only by a small amount. However, in February 2020, so literally, if you're listening to this right now, it's only just over a year ago, Herbert's sentence was yet again reduced to 14 and a half years. Now, the reason for that was because of the progress that he's made whilst he's been in prison. Make of that what you will. I think we all agree here that young people are definitely developing. Their brains are developing. Their experience with family, environment, education all have a huge impact on who they are. So if you've gone to prison and you've been given discipline, and for some people, right, prison is better than home. My young offenders that I used to work with, I used to diagnose them with products of a shitty life because being inside was better than being at home. That is awful. No child's life at 18, 19 should be better in prison than at home. That's a failure on the family's part. It's a failure on society's part. So I do accept that if you've had a negative experience growing up and then suddenly you're given the discipline, the education, the opportunity, fed three times a day, and you've learned to be restorative in your justice and you've understood your impact, then actually getting you back into society before you become too institutionalised and putting you on licence and making sure that you abide by an appropriate code is probably better for society, but also awful for the family of Sophie, right? Because that's one of the things that we all think about, isn't it? How is it impacting on the victim's family? Now, again, I'm going to say Herbert in prison has thrived. He'd taken on a mentoring role in a rehabilitation program. And this is the description, as the prison service have described him. He is one of the most reliable, sensitive and conscientious students. So maybe acknowledging his age, looking at his progress, and the result of that being seen as an individual who probably can thrive in our community, is something that's been taken into consideration. Doesn't bring Sophie back, does it? But also, what does it say about the family? That he's thrived in prison that way. That he's become one of the most reliable, sensitive and conscientious students. So ironically, prison has changed his life for the better. Now the court case itself completely split the community of Bake Up. The perpetrators belonged to some really notorious criminal families and that meant that there was support of those criminal families. In fact, it was noted that if you supported Sophie's family, you were defying the criminal element of Bake Up. I'm defying the criminal element of Bake Up right now. I'm defying it because I'm calling them out. I'm saying that they and what they did and who they created are responsible for Sophie Lancaster's death. Everyone needs to call that out. Criminal or otherwise, scary or otherwise, otherwise we don't change society. So yeah, the only victims here are Sophie's family and Robert's family. And anyone who defends the criminal family, well, you're as bad as they are. It even, in the local area, led to the ostracism of some of the mothers. Can you believe that? That mothers in that area got ostracised because they were supporting Sophie. Four of the young people who actually saw the crime, they were awarded £250 each and they were commended by the judge for giving evidence and defying gang loyalties. And £250 doesn't sound a lot, does it? But it's really hard to get criminal injuries, it really is. And you have to show a massive amount of trauma to get the higher payments, and even then, they're very low. But I agree. I agree. Imagine coming from a really small area, being afraid of the individuals with that criminal element who can cause you really big problems. And you as a young person, a young adult, you stand in court and you tell the truth. It takes incredible guts. And also, you're looking at the possibility of certain retribution. Defying gang loyalty is not something that is taken lightly. 
Having said that, there haven't been any reports of any recriminations in the town since. So in spite of those fears and in spite of what I've said about those families, the truth is they haven't gone out of their way to cause anybody any issues. On the 12th of November 2007, I can't tell you how many hundreds of people attended Sophie's funeral. It stopped traffic where I live. It was held at the Riverside Centre Whitworth, and that was where Sophie liked to walk. So they did it in a place that had great meaning to her, a place where she went to think, a place where she went to live with nature, be with nature, a place that reminded everyone of the beautiful human that she was, the ethical, vegetarian, the deep thinker. And after her funeral, after the ceremony, the guests were actually all asked to write messages to Sophie in black marker pen on her white coffin. It just breaks my heart when you think about that. But also, it's that recognition, isn't it, in that moment, that the family knew that she was never going to get those opportunities to leave university, to have those messages from her friends that you have when you say goodbye. She never got to do that. She never got to go and study her degree. And that was a way of them sending those messages with her. And it's a beautiful scene, albeit a very sad one. I'm also going to acknowledge that Robert has been interviewed 10 years after the attack, and he said that he didn't believe it was a hate crime. He said that even though it was reported that Sophie was killed because she was a goth, he said that that's being too nice to the killers. He said it isn't a hate crime, it's just because a group of arseholes killed her. So he sees it as these are just murderous individuals who wanted to cause anybody harm. And he actually says, and this is his quote, why can't we ask what it is about them that made them want to murder someone? Not what it is about someone that made them be murdered. It's really interesting, isn't it? And he actually says that he feels like it's almost victim blaming because they use words like goth and mosher and so on and so forth. He also said that they weren't actually wearing goth clothing when they were attacked. Yes, they had piercings, so they had a braided hair, that set them apart, but they certainly weren't in their gear that would distinctly make them so outside the realms of what young people were wearing. And it's important to hear his view, because he was in the attack. Nonetheless, I still think that standing out in a situation like this can put you in more danger, even though you don't deserve it. But I think it's true, you know when it comes down to it, they were attacked by a group of assholes. I also want to talk about the Sophie Lancaster Foundation because that is what Sophie's mother set up straight away and what an incredible woman she is. The Sophie Lancaster Foundation was established as a lasting legacy to Sophie. They worked tirelessly. The charity is all about promoting tolerance and acceptance for others. And it has this mission statement, and the mission statement is to stamp out prejudice, hatred, and intolerance everywhere. The acronym, SOPHIE. The Hume brothers and Mallet, well, they were out on prison and back on the streets years ago. Herbert was eligible for parole in February 2020, and Harris is going to be eligible probably around now. Listen, the truth is, all of them have the potential to settle down, have kids, have careers, do all the things that Sophie will never do, do all the things that they stole from Sophie. Sophie's family are going to continue to live that life sentence, but they're absolutely determined that her death will not be in vain. In fact, for some of you in the UK particularly, although I'm sure you get Coronation Street all over the world, we have a series that's been running for like 735 years called Coronation Street. And it was so moved by Sophie Lancaster's experience that they actually did a storyline that was inspired on 
an individual being attacked that way. And it was a popular character, Nina Lucas and Seb Franklin, and they were basically violently assaulted by a gang. And Sophia Lancaster's mother said that she really hopes that that would have a major impact on how people view those people who come from alternative subcultures and, of course, help tackle the problem of hate crime. I always want to talk about legacies. I don't know how, as a parent, you ever recover from the loss of a child. I don't, I don't. But a little bit like Brett Bedner and his incredible mother, Lauren, it seems that when individuals who have gone through such trauma and loss are able to take the pain and make it into something progressive, make it into something that changes the course of other people's lives, that they keep that child alive and that they breathe life into a life that cannot live its full potential once again. And apart from the unbelievable strength that Sophie's mother has, the actual foundation itself is incredible. I have attended workshops and it is brilliant. So I just want to shout out the fact that as a family, not only did they go through this incredible loss, they created an incredible gift. And how many of us really have the internal strength and power to be able to do that? And Sophia Lancaster will live on forever. She's touched the lives of so many. And also we must remember Robert in this, an innocent victim who has become a story and a narrative that he never wanted to become. And to just acknowledge that and to acknowledge his feelings here. I hope you found that interesting. It's devastating. I also think it's interesting to bring in the perspectives of Robert regarding his differential idea regarding the attack compared to the hate crime idea that comes from other areas. And it's okay that there are conflicting understandings and feelings in this. What's important is I identify and express them. Like I said, very local to me, very personal to me. Haslington High, my sister's taught her for 30 years. She's an English teacher there. So this is a story that I have known from day one. I hope I've done it justice. I hope that you carry Sophie with you a little bit in your hearts from today. And I hope that we remind ourselves that very often being distinctive isn't about overconfidence, it's quite the opposite. It's about defence. And unfortunately for Sophie and Robert, to some degree, that defence caused them offence and the offence of others and the attack of others. And it's a terrible, terrible thing to have happened to two innocent, amazing, incredible human beings who should be living their lives happily, beautifully, wonderfully together. Thanks for joining me. Like I said, support me on Patreon if you fancy. Please give me a like. If you come and watch this and don't subscribe, please subscribe. And remember, I always release content on a Wednesday and a Sunday, and I also do the live chats. So it's always cool having an hour with you guys. So if you haven't joined me for one of those, please do. And I'll see you next time for True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Take care.